Hello, everybody. Welcome to a post news update for Friday, June the 4th. I am John Pollock alongside Wei Ting. How are you, Wei? Doing good, John. Yourself? I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. We are getting set for another four hour evening of SmackDown, AEW Dynamite uh, excitement. Are you ready for tonight? Of course. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on with this AEW schedule. It's It seems like it's bouncing all over the place. Yeah. So on TNT's schedule, it is listed again for Friday next week. And then Tony Khan was just on Busted Open Radio and stated that Saturday, June 26th, they will be doing a Saturday night edition of Dynamite. And that show is going to feature the Kenny Omega Jungle Boy title match that had initially been promoted as in two weeks after the Casino Battle Royale, but they will now hold it on June the 26th. So it looks like, yeah, the the NBA is going to be um, bouncing AEW around like a basketball. Oh, my. Okay, so uh, again, next week, we're scheduled for a Friday Dynamite. It's listed for Friday. Yeah, that's what TNT is listing for next Friday. We'll have confirmation, I'm sure, tonight. But then the week after, the what what will it be? That I don't know as of as of now. Um, okay. Again, it's it's also like when you're dealing with the playoffs, it's like if certain series get extended, like that throws the schedule. It's not as though you can just map it out for the whole month, but at least for that Saturday, they do know that will be a free night, so they will run on on the 26th. So that's what we know right now. It's not going to be the easiest month for AEW. And what we saw last weekend, whether people are going to be able to find the show, keep up with the show, um, but we will we will see. I I do think they will do better tonight, just given the buzz off of the pay per view, and it's the second week in a row on Friday. So we'll see. It's not ideal, but it's what they have to deal with being on TNT, which again goes to the point that hopefully they won't have these issues on TBS um, next year because you won't have the the NBA problem. Yeah, I think we've seen, you know, the loyalty be being tested quite a bit from this AEW audience. And while I think they, you know, will make every effort to find it, I mean, it, it's definitely demanding a little too much. Um, it's it's hard to when you don't even know ahead of time, especially for a podcaster. So. That's the, the number one priority is screwing with our lives. So hopefully, hopefully they can get all of that uh, under wraps. Uh, tonight's show will feature... The Young Bucks against Pac and Penta, non-title match. Bull rope match between Dustin Rhodes and Nick Camaroto. Jungle Boy and Christian against Private Party. Red Velvet versus The Bunny. Cody Rhodes and Lee Johnson against QT Marshall and Anthony Agogo. Dr. Britt Baker's championship celebration. An appearance by Mark Henry. Tony Schiavone enters Sting and Darby Allen. And wait for it. The Inner Circle's victory lap. Ooh, okay. Sounds like a pretty full show. Um, I don't know. If not, it's not, a, not, a, not a gigantic lineup. I would say the big thing is the Young Bucks are wrestling. Um, bull rope match. I'm imagining we're going to get a lot of blood in that one, just given the history when they did the last bull rope match. Um, so I could see that being a violent one. Um, the rest, it's it's a show on paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't. it's coming off of a pay-per-view. I think that's probably the main hook. Are we going to have crowds for this one? Yes. Yeah, it's a live show tonight. So it's, oh, a, it's the same format as last week where they'll be there for two hours for um, the, all the dark tapings from 8 till 10 and then live at 10. All right. SmackDown has Ray and Dominic defending the tag titles against the Usos and Apollo Crews against Kevin Owens for the IC title with Commander Aziz banned from ringside. So we will see if, I guess, Roman Reigns' involvement in the main event. I'm kind of curious. I was thinking about this because um, Saturday... Um, at the, what is it? The, uh, the Belmont stakes, they're announcing the location for SummerSlam. Given that you're on that platform, I would be really curious if you have your main event locked, should they just announce the main event with the location this early? Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Like, maybe. like it does somewhat establish a lame duck period for Roman Reigns, but I don't think it, like he basically has no program. For Hell in a Cell, I mean, you can get, but you have to get by in essence two pay per view cycles because you also have the July one. But like again, I've said this before. I always liked the big SummerSlam programs where they pretty much told you right from the beginning of the summer what we are building up to, and for a match 
uh, for for a big stadium show at SummerSlam, I think you could like if it turns out to be the rumored match between Roman Reigns and John Cena, I see no harm in announcing it now, uh, unless they feel that maybe maybe announcing John Cena might provide some backlash. Could be that you know um I I'm I'm more of the mind that they probably want to hold off on that announcement for you know when so that their other storylines don't really get interrupted. Um, I think. If you're announcing it to a casual audience, it's probably the name SummerSlam that, you know, is as much value as maybe a headlining match itself. But um, I I imagine they'll probably hold off on that announcement. Um, we also have uh, this coming weekend, Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Logan Paul, way Sunday night. I'm, I'm very interested to see how well this does. Like, I think it's going to do uh, a sizable number. Um, I certainly don't see anywhere in the ballpark of Mayweather and Conor McGregor, but I don't know. Do you, do you sense this one just being too absurd that it's it's not going to work as a pay-per-view? Or do you think that it's there's still such a novelty to this bizarre fight that it, it will draw well? I think it'll draw well. I mean, it's a Paul brother against, you know, arguably the most successful boxer of the past generation. So um, it's it is uh, definitely up there in terms of like all time crazy freak show fights. Um, I find an interesting, you know, um, maybe an element, you know, to this whole thing is with the U.S. opening up a whole lot more. Are people going to be more likely to be out on a Saturday rather than you know being Sunday. sticking around? Sorry, on a Sunday, you know, rather than sticking around all, uh, you know, all at home watching pay-per-view is there going to be less of a market or are they more likely to like hang out at a friend's house you know will that affect the number of buys um do you think this does as well as the jake paul fight well the thing the weird thing is like that triller number i mean it's been disputed it's like i don't know if we have like a firm grasp on what that card did because yeah i would like i i believe mayweather fighting logan paul i i do see this topping one and a half million buys i do see that happening but, you know, when you're talking about, you know, numbers that like him and Connor pulled in, that was over four off the top of my head. Like that to me is not anywhere where this fight has has translated for people. But it's also it's drawing upon an audience that is much beyond even like the fringe fight fan. I mean, it's it's just the novelty is it out there myself. I like I don't uh, dismiss these kinds of uh, sideshow fights, but I don't even have like the weird curiosity to see the absurdity of this to me, it's just, it's like, I'm not that interested in it at all, not to pay for it, but I certainly won't be stunned if this does some extraordinary giant number that we hear about next week. I feel like I would be a lot more interested if, you know, there was really nothing else going on. Um, I'm, I'm probably more likely to watch it after the fact on in highlight form rather than you know but i mean if if i'm bored on a on a sunday evening yeah maybe i'll try to check it out i am interested in jake paul and tyron woodley i will not lie when that when that fight happens like i As will a be a real competitive fight you're interested mm, i mean it is a boxing fight and there are people that believe like jake and like tyron woodley again like he is certainly um a step up from Ben Askren, but again, not a traditional boxer. This was another guy that was, you know, his foundation was wrestling, but it is like for what Jake Paul is doing, this is an escalation of an opponent. And like, what, it, what do you it, think odds would be? Are they out yet? They, I don't, I think Jake Paul is a favorite on, on some sports books, but uh, we can look for it. I mean, great. it's, Again, it's what are yeah he is my uh, I'm looking at sports betting dime has Jake Paul minus one fifty. Wow, that's amazing to me. But against I mean, a former yeah, a UFC sport. welterweight champion, but again, th- like this is a boxing fight. It's a different yeah. sport. Um, but again, that's that's the curiosity they're banking on is that exact reaction you just had. What mm-hmm. Tyron Woodley's the underdog. Um, so anyway, that fight is happening in the summer. Uh, there isn't t- uh, a ton to go through today. Interesting to note is that uh, we'll get into our discussion of Dark Side of the Ring, uh, but Vice TV is going to be doing a an additional documentary that's not part of the Dark Side of the Ring franchise. They're going to do a two-hour documentary on China, Joni Lauer, on June the 19th. It'll be in the same slot that Dark Side of the Ring was in, but not part of that franchise. It's a two-hour documentary. 
It'll feature interviews with... Sorry. Is it the 19th or is it the 17th? It is. No, I have... The 19th would be a Saturday. Oh, then it's the 17th. Yeah. Um, but w- whatever the Thursday is, I will... Uh, let's look it up here just so we're not wrong. Okay. So Thursday, June 17th, 9 p.m. Eastern on Vice TV. So uh, this is being branded as vice versa, but they will have interviews with her mother, her sister, and they mentioned Sean Waltman, McFoley, Vince Russo, Billy Gunn. So it will be yet uh, a- a- an interesting story, certainly, because if you remember, they were filming a documentary on on China right up until she died in 2016. And I would imagine that they'll have a lot of footage of those that final year or so with her and all of her struggles that she had been going through. So you're saying that the footage used for that other documentary will be seen here? My understanding, like they mentioned that there was a documentary being filmed on her in the press release. So I imagine like this is all being done um, in concert with, with one another, with the people that were doing that original documentary. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, Dark Side of the Ring has been um, Vice's biggest success on TV, at least so far. And uh, it only makes sense that they would try to continue to branch out off of that uh, great, I don't know, um, reputation thus far with other documentaries. Uh, This is a part of a series called Vice Versa, which also seems to have other documentaries coming out later this month about college sports. Uh, There's another one about Meghan Markle. So it just seems like to be sort of a more of your, you know, investigative feature length documentary that, you know, as far as we know from this press release that the producers of Dark Side of the Ring don't have anything to do with. But nonetheless, it's like it'll probably have that similar, um, you know, vice investigative tone. We shall see, you know, how deep it gets, how much um, perhaps uh, there is to offer for, you know, people who are familiar with China's story. I'm also curious if they go about wwe footage the same way dark side of the ring has i mean it's very hard to do a two-hour documentary on china without any wwe footage in there definitely so that will take us to thursday's um latest episode of dark side of the ring the shadow of grizzly smith which i think everyone going into this uh you know this was not a story that i knew in depth um but enough of the details are out there that you knew this was going to be a really rough watch it was incredibly hard to uh, stomach some of the stories in this one. I will say that you know people might have different opinions of you know their favorite Dark Side of the Ring, which has been like the best documentary. To me, this one was the most important documentary that they did. This really was the furthest removed from a pro wrestling documentary and really a documentary about the survival of these children through horrific acts by Grizzly Smith and. At the end of it, um, to me, just shining a light on something that often it's very difficult for people to come forward with these and stuff like this lives in secret and goes to the grave with some people of what they have struggled with in their upbringing. It was just it was horrifying um, for an hour. Yeah, it was uh, one of the more difficult watches that I think Dark Side of the Ring has presented. Um, You know, for people who haven't seen it, it really goes in depth about Grizzly Smith, who is the father of Jake the Snake Roberts, Sam Houston, Rockin' Robin, and... uh, Richard Neighbors, who is the the one um, child who did not get involved in the wrestling Mm -hmm. industry. And, you know, in Jake and Robin's case, really gets into Grizzly Smith's, uh, man, sexual abuse, or at least um, with Robin's case. And then in Jake's case, it would be his stepmother. Um, just uh, horrifying, horrifying stuff to to hear, and you know, like it, the fact that they were able to you know conduct interviews with all four of them, um, and, and to be able to you know hear them speak today, and you know, of course, Jake is such a uh, you know incredible, expressive like you know speaker. Um, you you really just see the the effects of this sort of terrible shadow that that looms among them, um, their lives, even to this day, it it really just kind of shows the effects of God, what a, what terrible experiences can have on, on a person's life. Yeah. I mean, for for those that are, you know, familiar with the, with the scene and beyond the mat that I'm sure everyone was, 
um, referencing after watching this. I mean, there is that scene with, with Jake and his father and Jake explaining how how he was conceived. And it's it's a pretty dark moment in Beyond the Mat. And this expands on it significantly. And Jake, you know, speaking about like the difference of Jake Roberts versus Aurelian Smith Jr., who stopped growing at 12 or 13. He's more comfortable now as Jake and just how psychologically scarred he was from his upbringing, the lack of love his father showed him just you can you can see that even all these years later just despises this man and right down to the fact that his father um would not clue him in to the secrets of his industry that would sell injuries at home and you know we we kind of laugh when we hear Bret Hart talking about you know being in fear of Archer the Stomper Gouldy coming to the home to kill his family but you also look at the effect that could have on a child when you compound it with all these other issues as well. Um, Robin Smith to me was like, what a remarkable individual that she has come out of this. Um, I thought it was so telling the line at the end that he ruined my childhood, but he is not going to ruin the rest of my life. And man, there is, um, and would have been completely understandable if she had never been able to, put this past her. I just, I found her to be remarkable in this documentary to be able to speak about it openly, to reflect on it. And, you know, appears to be living her life without allowing this to cast that, that weight on her shoulders. Completely. You know, I think her and Jake, you know, seeing them at this point, like um, to me, they, they are, they're, you know, inspirations, uh, Robin, especially, you know, and I think that was part of the reason why she wanted to be a part of this project was to, you know, be able to uh, inspire people who may may have gone through the same thing as her to, you know, um, persevere in whatever way that they can. Jake is a really fascinating one because, I mean, yes, we did know elements of the story. I don't know if it's been ever discussed in this detail, but Jake is also somebody who we've seen glimpses of in documentary form over the past two, 20 years. In various stages of his life, throughout his various progressions, of course, starting from Beyond the Mat, then he had his own uh, documentary, uh, The Resurre- Resurrection of Jake the, St- the Snake. And this, at this point, you know, almost feels like he is now 10 years sober um, and at a stage in his life where he is still clearly dealing with so many personal issues, yet seems to be at a place where he could speak um, cl- with, with clarity about it all. Um, but really heartbreaking to hear all the stories involved here, you know, starting with the death of their sister or the kidnapping of their sister. And, you know, at this point, I, I, su- I suppose, presumed death. Yeah, this was uh, their half sister, Jo Lynn, who was Robin had suspected that she had been abused as well. But I guess Jo Lynn had never outright told her that. And she is kidnapped in 1979 when they were in Tatum, Texas. And. It ended up the the prime suspect was the ex-wife of Joe Lynn's husband, who was uh, significantly older than Joe Lynn, but they could never charge her with murder uh, because there was no body that was ever discovered. Uh, instead, it was a aggravated kidnapping that we, she was convicted of, and they were able to find the former uh, chief of police in Tatum uh, to go over the case and this, I mean, God, where we're talking 42 years ago and explain like where their hands were tied and could not uh, press further charges, but I guess had a seven year prison stay. Um, you know, th- there was like some really great um, investigating here into this specific case. And I mean, you just, it's really heartbreaking that, you know, there was a brutal upbringing for all of these individuals and, like I was aware of the kidnapping and death of the half sister, but just to hear it and the words from Richard, who was very close with Joe Lynn, I mean, it's just this is just like an a uh, a childhood you cannot possibly describe. It's one mm-hmm. brutal story after the other, and it makes it all the more mm, easy to understand why they would you know, at least in Jake's case, go on to have the amount of issues that he would go on to have. 
you know, we like they even bring up um Heroes of Wrestling here and they show clips of it. Um we've we've reviewed that that show a number of times in the past and progressively, you know, the first time we watched it, I think we watched it like many people did at the time. Like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Haha, ha, this is crazy. Look at this man acting, you know, nuts. Progressively, we've reviewed this show three times, everybody, and um progressively, the la- up until the last time we watched it, it just becomes more and more sad and becomes less and less funny and especially now in a context like this knowing so much more about jake's background it you you know like you see something like that and it's just you and you know what the man's been through throughout his entire life you you have a an understanding of of man you know having lived through that type of childhood having lived through you know the personal experiences with his father and the rest of his family like yeah, I would like you completely understand what what would drive somebody to addiction, and uh, you know, uh, I thought the documentary kind of framed it all, you know, pretty well in forty minutes. Yeah, I mean the the overarching shadow that this documentary exists under is Grizzly Smith, who is nothing short of a monster. Um, you know, you will, you know, if. You know, it, Grizzly Smith, for those like that, it's a generation or two removed from uh, your watching. I mean, was, you know, like a significant primarily tag wrestler as a member of the Kentuckians that went all over the place, traveling the territories, feuding with the assassins and then having more of a behind the scenes role in Mid-South and WCW, you know, had a had a very good career, um, but it is. Like, none of this is a biographical trip down memory lane on the career of Grizzly Smith. It is the unspeakable horrors that he inflicted upon so many people and God knows how many others, uh, because the amount of stories that were just shared here, um, whether it be direct with Jake, who acknowledged his mother was 13 when he was born, when uh, Grizzly Smith is... With Nicola Roberts, who is the ex-wife of Sam Houston, um, they just randomly, he picks up this 14, 15-year-old girl for this road trip with the parents sending her off with Grizzly Smith. And then Robin sharing this other story about one day Grizzly knocking on her door to come in with a nine-year-old girl. And Robin not allowing this girl to leave with Grizzly Smith. Like, Robin is just a saint in this documentary. This is just, it's horrifying. Horrifying stuff. And, um, I mean, there's just, you can't describe this Grizzly Smith figure uh, without just being repulsed. I mean, that's that's where your conclusion can only come by the end of this. Mm Mm-hmm. It sort of ends with like a discussion because you hear from all four siblings, but you know, to uh, up until this point, like they they don't indicate that they they have any sort of relationship that all four siblings are estranged from one another, and it almost ends with you leading to think that oh maybe they'll all like come together at the end here, uh, but they leave that open ended, and you know I believe all four of them have pretty much said that they would like to reconnect, but they either don't know how or because there's just been so much, oh. So many scars between all of them that maybe it's not even a possible thing. But I also found it interesting how, you know, when they did discuss um, Grizzly Smith's death, they gave several kind of um, different, different reactions to it. You have Richard who like, you know, was in tears describing it. Um, And was his caretaker up until the end because uh, Grizzly Smith, um, he, he died in June of 2010. Um, uh, and was suffering from Alzheimer's at the end. Mm-hmm. He actually says that he re- recognizes that despite, you know, being given up for adoption, he recognizes that he was the lucky one among, you know, the children and doesn't seem to harbor at least, or it seems to have like forgiven Sam, Sam Houston still says like he was really hurt. He says it was the worst news that he heard when he found out his father died and you have his ex-wife. He still looks at his father like with the like the like veil of like his hero. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't get the sense, certainly not in Robin's case, and I don't get the sense in Jake's case they feel the same way. So it, it, it would be really interesting to see what sort of follow up. I would love to know. And maybe this is what we get, you know, in a, 
the confidential series in the future on an episode mm. like this. But I would love to know the siblings' reactions to watching this and, you know, if there's any follow-up conversation between the four. Yeah. It was interesting, like, the line you mentioned from Richard about him being the lucky one. Uh, like, did you take that as, like, I almost took it as I didn't have to grow up around all of this. Like, mm. I was lucky that I was put up for adoption and removed from this disaster. You could be right. Yeah, that that could be the, you know, the proper interpretation. Um, oh, yeah, it's. Do, do you remember a few years ago, it was at a WrestleCon that we met Robin? Vaguely, not not so much, actually. I'm trying to remember it. It's a it's a bit hazy, but I seem to recall we were doing some interviews and I as I remember it, she actually came up to us um, to talk to us just about what we were doing. Just like a pleasant woman to speak with. I can't remember if I interviewed her or not, but I do remember chatting with her for for a little while. And it was just, just a wonderful person to speak to. Mm. But that was my only interaction with, with, with Robin. Um, I, ju I just thought she – like it's just an amazing uh, – and like that's not to say that – you know, you look at, at Jake, I think this really does inform the life he has lived and that that is a huge byproduct of just all of this that he has attempted to suppress. And it seems that at this stage of his life is at least like, I think this was probably very therapeutic to get a lot of this out. And again, this goes to, you know, this, this series, I'm sure was very helpful for, you know, the, the children, at least of Grizzly Smith to have this. Yeah, you would certainly hope so. Yeah, you would certainly hope so. Um, you know, in Jake's case, I, I feel like something like this informs you of maybe even his wrestling promos um, character, the, the character of Jake the Snake. He kind of talks about how, you know, he became Jake the Snake when he was, what, like 13, 14, because he shut the door on Aurelian Smith Jr. a long time ago. And um, talks about, like, kind of having to dig into this sort of darkness for his style of promo, um, all of that, you know, and even just entering wrestling itself, he did it to spite his father who told him that he would never amount to anything. So all of this kind of like completely reframes his career um, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, that it's a whole other layer to the story that's kind of addressed, but I'm sure you could go further into it is that here is this, person that is described as a monster and completely ap accurate um, that has a success in this industry that three out of the four children follow him in. And yes, like Michael, you can see like looks at him in one viewpoint with Jake. It is to prove his father wrong. Like you can see like there is this, this desire to find uh, some kind of affection from his father. Um, and then with Robin, they don't really go into like what her brought her to wrestling other than she she started training and got praise and suddenly she's in the WWF for for several years. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole nother study about that, about like what would drive somebody to enter the family business, you know, especially when you have harbor such resentment for the patriarch of that family. Um, but you know, I'm I'm sure she she can f talk further about it all in a future interview. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we should also we, we we've kind of like um you know uh, gone over like the issues that the Robin and Jake had, but I mean also like Michael Sam Houston. I mean, just they they do spend a lot of time just on his massive DUI drinking history. problems, DUIs, just endless amounts, and an attempted suicide that um that failed um, that, you know, this guy was right at, at, you know, looking at his life as well. And all of the problems existed, you know, it's, it seemed like Richard was the only one who did not, you know, share and who knows like what, whatever issues, you know, he did or did not have, but of the three, I mean, it, it's remarkable that some of these they're people alive. are still here, that they're still here. Yeah. No, for, without a doubt, like you, this, this whole story is, you know, to me, re kind of reminiscent of the Von Eric family story in, in that it's just like one beat of tragedy after another, um, that, that, that affects every single person. 
And, you know, the fact that this documentary managed to get four siblings here to talk about it all, uh, really quite remarkable in itself. So I, I hope they continue to just, you know, serve as examples of, of perseverance through a uh, terrible, terrible upbringing. Yeah. I mean, when you look at, at figures in professional wrestling's past, I mean, Grizzly Smith is right at the bottom. I mean, there's some, mm-hmm. some horrible figures. I mean, he has a special place. So that was Dark Side of the Ring. A very difficult watch, but I think an important one. I think one that is certainly going to stay with people um, that watch this. Like, it, it's pretty haunting, but I think also extremely important to watch. And the message at the end of people reaching out and having, you know, the ability to not let this go unnoticed and keep it a secret. Let somebody know. I thought like there was like a great service done by, by this documentary. It's what you would hope, you know, when, when people like take the courage to kind of volunteer their time to get into something so dark and personal to broadcast for an audience, you hope that they are doing it in service of a greater good. And uh, yeah, um, I, I certainly hope that this had that effect. So I thought a great job, actually, from the uh, Dark Side of the Ring producers. I I thought a really fantastic job by that team. And, you know, the kind of uh, documentary uh, series will kind of finish up this weekend with uh, we we will have a kind of stampede kind of sub theme with Brett on Sunday and then Tom Billington on the Dark Side of the Ring next Thursday. So I, I think both of those will be very captivating. I would like Brett is. Um, he is brutally honest. So I think that will make that a fascinating documentary. I think there's the interest of how it's handled from a WWE perspective, given their involvement. Um, but it's going to be like Brett's narrative and not so much, um, you know, just a WWE point of view. Like Brett will be the central figure for all of these stories. And I think he has a high level of credibility when it comes to his stories and his documenting and keeping notes throughout his career. His book is among the most thorough that's ever been published. So I, I have high hopes for that one and I'm, I'm going into it understanding that Montreal will be significant. Oh yeah, it has to be, you know, but, but, you know, much like Jake, I mean, there have been plenty of documentaries, of course, uh, done on Brett the Hitman Hart. So I think us included, us included, yeah. So throughout the years, I think we are very familiar with his stance. Brett is also one to to be to be known to never not change his opinion a whole lot. So I don't know if we're gonna get that much different. At the same time, it will be nice to see you know updated kind of like views on how he, especially actually with Montreal, it would be interesting because I mean it's been so many years removed from it. He has kind of rekindled, um, or at least like. I feel like he has gotten over some of it, but uh, we'll see exactly how much. Because I'm sure when you drag that stuff back out, you'll you will still get like 1998 Bret Hart, you know, or 1997. He, he is Hart. always going to have his convictions, and I've yeah. I think justified when you look at, when you break down all the facts and you understand that story. I think he's very justified. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I think oh, he. Is, oh, what about Vince? You know, hopefully we get to hear from him and Sean. I mean, we we kind of know they have to. They have too, to be but. in this one. So that that will be interesting to hear. Vince's take that has always been very uh, of one mindset, you know, Sean, it's like you, you can see like he had a very, when Brett was on the outs with the company, he had, you know, one firm stance. And I think he very much has relaxed that over the years and kind of taken his uh, responsibility. Um, The fact that uh, I was fully expecting last week's Mick Foley one uh, to have a significant presence of Vince Russo, since we had seen him interviewed for the warrior one, there was no Vince Russo in that one. Um, So I'm imagining Russo will be significant or not significant, but featured in this one, because what other what other documentary would he have been interviewed for? But this one. True. Yeah. I I wonder if some of that has to do with the fact that they split up production for so many different documentaries. Like, I don't know if they're necessarily sharing footage, but I, you would assume that they all would, right? If you want to. Well, it's it, like there's some. Out. Like, you can see, like, Ariel Hawani has been spliced throughout a few, and it's the same mm-hmm. sit down. There's been a few of those crossover interviews, uh, even though you do have kind of the different, you know, set of producers in, in charge of mm-hmm. each. But I, I'm looking forward to the one on Sunday. I think it will be uh, intriguing nonetheless. And Tom Billington, again, it's. um. It's it's doing it within 44 minutes. Like there is so much to Tom Billington 
uh, that that you can go into, and, and a lot of it dark. So that will be. Yeah. Those will be, and and there will be a lot of crossover between those two documentaries. Has there been a Tom Billington documentary produced? They did. I mean, they did one after. I want to say a year after Benoit had died. It wasn't specific to Tom Billington, but it was sort of like a look at pro wrestling. And there was like that is where his um, his former wife was interviewed, and it told of you know a lot of the the stories involving Tom Billington. But this is the first like full on documentary dedicated just to Tom Billington. Mm-hmm. Like he is a figure that you know prior to Dark Side of the Ring appearing, I don't think any service like he's not a big enough name that somebody would just dedicate that amount of budget to you know producing a full feature on the guy so i'm really interested in seeing that one for the very first time um and man like some of these topics you see and i'm actually surprised that we haven't already had dark side of the ring episodes on them because they feel like such major stories in the wrestling world that you know just haven't had that coverage yet so i mean this this series continues to kind of surprise us with um what's left out there to talk about all right so we're gonna wrap it up there but uh fear not we will be back later tonight twelve fifteen a.m eastern get ready we are going to be live for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. you can sign up postwrestlingcafe.com it's the beginning of the month so it's the best time to sign up tons of archives to access immediately and join us live for rewind a dyna down Two. this may be an ongoing series at least for this month uh there's there's going to be a lot of dyna a few dyna downs left uh it's always you know a late night party we're going into saturday pretty much saturday morning midnight we'll be up late so join us if you're in the in the post wrestling cafe and uh yeah we'll start probably right at midnight the room will be open yeah, so uh, join us tonight. We'll be going through those episodes, and we have a packed week of shows uh, coming up. We're going to have an extra show out on Monday covering Dominion for cafe members and lots of great stuff that we will be uh, going over over the next week. So uh, look out for that. Oh, quickly, before uh, – because we won't get a chance to talk to most of you. Uh, the Long and Winding World Road this Sunday, it'll be a huge episode that WH Park will be doing with Case Lowe about the uh, – career of kenta kobashi um it, it it's it's a wonderful kind of like deep dive into some of his greatest matches during his all japan run and just a, a lot of information about the man himself so look for that saturday after or sunday afternoon yeah this is the third kind of bio, biographical edition of the show that wh has done after excellent episodes on masawa and kawada so tackling kenta kobashi on sunday uh, it should be a fantastic listen so uh, look out for the long and winding royal road on sunday all of that can be found at postwrestling.com subscribe here on the youtube channel and we will speak with you tonight at midnight